Welcome to another episode of Bootstrapped in the Trenches. Today we go over how to approach strangers and the importance of connection. We will be breaking down Malcolm Gladwell's Talking to Strangers. And we're interviewing Brandon Wilton, the founder and CEO of Perpetual Media Network and a partner in Wilton Partners. I met Brandon through my great friend Paul a couple weeks ago in the city, Dan. Great guy. Uh, pumped to have him on. I'm sure it'll be entertaining and informative. And uh, we're missing Corey today. He is recovering from Corona. Corey, get better soon. Hopefully we'll have you back next week. We've missed your foods for thought. Big time on here. And uh, without further ado, though, we'll go into Dan's food coma from Sunday night. Did you and Danny have some Dan Dan noodles? <laughs> Uh, we, we've yet to have the Dan Dan noodles. When we do, we're going to definitely make a YouTube channel and put it on there for you, though. Wow. But, yeah, last night, though, so we've been cooking a lot. But last night, we each ordered out separately, and I ordered fried chicken, mashed potatoes, and cornbread, and it was amazing. I was actually oh, really oh, happy with it. Wow. Dude, I've been eating really well, and by well, I mean healthy. A lot of Hello Fresh, a lot of cooking. Danny's been cooking a lot of great food. Like, we haven't been eating out at all. It's actually been great. But last night, it was the first night that I've gotten delivery twice since being in this lockdown mode. Once was Thai. Once was last night. We also got takeout Indian, I think, on Friday night. Or it was either Friday or Saturday. And, yeah, just powering through. What about you? Uh, you know, I went hard in the paint on dumplings last night. It's been with this corona. I know a lot of the Chinese restaurants have been hit hard off of just the concept of people thinking, oh, I shouldn't eat Chinese food or something, which is ridiculous. Um, I do think that Chinese food's legit right now. I always go hard in the paint with it. Now that I'm in New York, I can tell you I've been eating dumplings at least once every 48 hours. So I'm trying to do my thing with supporting the Chinese restaurants here. Not like I wouldn't be otherwise, but uh, I think I'm eating a bit more dumplings than usual. So I, I think I ate 36 dumplings last night, which Did was you, pretty remarkable, Dan. That's, that's pretty awesome. I'm like, that's how you know the dumplings are good, that you could actually eat that many, because when you're, you know, in most places and you order Chinese food, three dumplings in and you're feeling it. But yeah, let me ask you a question. Do you take any extra caution now when you order delivery? Like once you get the bag, like are you, do you have a procedure? Well, yeah, definitely. I've been throwing the bag right out and then washing my hands. I mean, I've seen like Sean who it goes over the top with anything ever, every time anyway, even when there's not <laughs> Corona, he will wipe down with wipes, like the outside of the boxes and everything. And you know, for me, I just wash my hands after, and I, I always tell the driver to leave it at the door, and I wait. Like, I usually have the 10-second rule, just like food dropping usually is like the five seconds for people. For me, with the social distancing, I wait 10 seconds for the driver to leave before I grab my food at the door. And uh, oh, yeah. last night, I actually had a drop-off incident where the food was left at the wrong apartment uh, down, down the hall. So I was going downstairs thinking they left the food outside, which is a fear when you're on a no-contact delivery, thinking there's a misinterpretation on the handoff, where they're just buzzing up and leaving the food at the door without walking up. So I think that's what happened last night. And I went down and noticed they just dropped it off at an apartment a floor down. And it wasn't, it'd be one thing if it was the same letter, where it's like, oh, 4D, 3D. It was 4D, 3A. So it's like, dude, what's going on here? And it wasn't A, though. It was the first floor instead of the second. The dude clearly just didn't want to keep trudging up. And was like, fuck it. I'm done here. So you just walked down a floor, saw a random bag of food in front of someone's door, and assumed it was yours. I knew it was mine because of my order. There was like a San Pellegrino sticking out. Like, it was a very distinguished order where I, I, I was like, this has to be mine. You know, and it was sitting there long enough where I was like, there's no way someone just hasn't been taking this, and sure enough, it was my order. Unless someone ordered oatmeal with bananas, blueberries, and uh, a couple sandwiches that were mine to a tea. That's good, that's good. Well, dude, we should uh, just say, because this guy's probably going to call in in two minutes, you know, after he hangs up, 
we'll we'll kind of just touch base on everything happening over the last week and kind of dive into our thoughts because I feel like it's yeah people are interested in hearing about this type of thing and there's been some new developments over the last week just in terms of our own thoughts like what's going on you know definitely well yeah I'm gonna I'll uh, text Brandon this link here in a minute but any Dan in the mean in the next minute any food news you wanted to break down real fast I don't have any food news. I was just going to say that the food news I have is that, you know, it seems like all these restaurants are starting to, all these restaurants are starting to actually close down. And, you know, we definitely, today was the first time we had a lot of restaurants in our markets, like actually start to just hit us up being like, yeah, we're closing until this is all over. And there's definitely just been some talks that they're going to go into national shutdown mode where like the only things available would be, pharmaceuticals and potentially grocery stores so just keeping an eye on things it's kind of crazy to just it's crazy that like that the government has so much power that they could just shut down the whole damn world because that's what's happening right now that's that's what's like that's what i keep thinking about is all of a sudden everyone's just not doing anything and they have no choice yeah i mean it's i think this is going to be short term though i think we're going to hear something from trump next week my guess is that this lockdown is not going to be long term and he has an agenda around this. Yeah, I mean it really can't be. And the other thing that pisses me off that's like my new hot topic just mentally that I keep thinking about is this damn stimulus bill that Congress is like just not passing and it's the first time that they're like, you know, they're obviously just these rich Bucks hanging out, not seeing the impact of this, literally using the public as like pawns while they play their political games behind closed doors. I mean, you, I mean, dude, like a couple hours ago, the stimulus bill did not get passed because there were there was a hang up over things related to solar energy and abortion, and it's like, yo, leave that for another time. It's so like just wrong that that's. That's politics, though, Dan. It's all agendas around agendas, and everything's interconnected with these people. Of it's course, but this is like one time where you'd think they would, you know, either yeah. party, so, like someone would just man up and be like, you know what, fine, like we're, we'll give in on this just because it's for the greater good. And just, yeah, you're right, it is all politics, but it's crazy to think that that still is the front and center priority for these people when like the world's in shutdown mode right now it it just shows how disconnected they are to the reality of the impact of this situation yeah i mean it's uh it's pretty crazy brandon's just trying to get it just to show up on his computer i'm asking for his email yeah it is pretty crazy that's just uh that's what i keep thinking about it's just like how are they not just yeah you know, it just shows how disconnected they are or how little they actually give a shit about anything but themselves you know because i mean that just i makes... think every politician like at some point is such a megalomaniac to even be in that position like sure some of them it's like mr smith goes to washington that famous movie that you know they uh know. he just i don't know if i've see, seen that it, it's a you, it's one of those old flicks and he just is a guy that's all excited to be a politician Washington until he actually gets there and realizes what a disaster it is. True. I'm just sending Brandon over the link here. I'm yeah, sure. Just to see what it's like on the other side of the country. Yeah, I mean, it seems pretty comparable to New York, except from what I'm seeing on social media. It sounds like people are kind of just ignoring the the demands for everyone to stay home. But now I'm well, starting it's to. My problem. It's nice out to have that like when it's shitty outside i think it's way easier to retreat in that hibernation mode and when you have like a beach and 75 degree weather in front of you it's like oh uh what you know like and that not saying that i'm not even poking fun at that that's just the reality of it so i'm curious to see a brand yeah there he is brandon welton you're right on buddy yeah, up, how's it going? How's it going, man? Great to have you, man. Thanks for taking the time. Of course. Of course, appreciate What's it. What's been going on, dude? How's this coronavirus treating you out there? 
It's interesting, man. They just shut down the uh, the beaches and the parks because I guess we're all getting too active this weekend. So, um, you know, I think that at least down here, um, if everyone was still able to go outside, they could cope. But I'm not sure. Sir. I'm not sure sir, anymore. And it's uh, I don't know. Looks like 75 and sunny outside. So it's uh, tough sitting in here. Yeah. But. Right. I was asking Dan right before you got on, I'm like, it must be tough. Like, what's your take on this? Where I'm at in New York right now, where you were a couple of weeks ago, it's raining in 40. So it's easy to be in hibernation mode. <laughs> what is it like being, you know, locked down when you're like, oh, it's 75. I'm in Playa del Rey. I want to go hang out on the water. It's tough, man. You know, but uh, I think you realize that um, you know, all this stuff's being shut down for a reason and, you know, everyone's supposed to do their part. And I guess that if you don't, if you don't stay in when you're supposed to, um, you know, it kind of defeats the purpose and, you know, with what our country is going through and what the economic, um, outcome is going to be here, I guess, you know, it's all just part of, part of, uh, being part of the program, I guess, but hopefully, uh, hopefully this thing passes in the next month or two and everybody can get back to, you know, living, living their life. So let's see. Yeah, man, I'm with you. That would be great. I'm getting cabin fever over here. Uh, Didn't you have what, some nice weather last week, though? Oh, uh, yeah, definitely. It was nice. It's going to be back again, but I, I'd rather be out in Playa del Rey right now, to be honest. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah, man. But what's been the day in the life like? I mean, Brandon, I'm sure things lately have been a bit different business-wise. Has, has it changed drastically since this all started with Corona? Uh, for me, not so much, you know, I'd say a lot less meetings. Um, but you know, one of the ways that we built our company was, was software first, right. You know, for us, we were, uh, we tried to build a, a company that wasn't reliant on a, a huge headcount. And so we invested a lot of money in software so that we could leverage that software, uh, to make money while we sleep. And so I think that that's helped us kind of weather this storm, whereas since everything is automated, um, you know, we have really good partners who are out in the field and retail continuing to distribute our product. Um, you know, I'd say the biggest disruption is that half of our business is in the casino market. And I'm sure, as you know, the casinos are now all closed, um, you know, which was the, the right thing to do. But we think that'll be uh, that'll be temporary. So you know, it really hasn't changed that much except for uh, I'd say getting a little stir crazy in the house and uh, and switching some things to more phone calls. Yeah, man, Brandon. that's awesome. Kind of guy. Software, um, software yeah. business there with no human contact. I mean, I'm sure that's going to be a, a great <laughs> point for you heading forward too, with that type of uh, platform. It definitely helps. Wow. Well, could, you know, could you just kind of tell us a little bit more about the business? Like, how would you describe it? If I'm, I don't know much about it. I was on your website. I was really trying to understand it, and I was excited to just get on here and ask you. Like, what? Yeah. Explain it to me. What exactly is it? Yeah. So you know how how you go on, you know, Facebook or Instagram or your computer, and you get targeted ads, right? You know. Yeah. I think we've all become accustomed to that ads are part of our life, and so what we looked at was that, um, you know, the people's consumption before everyone quarantine in their house more people are spending time on the go right less people are spending time in front of their desktops um plenty of people have ad blockers installed people have decided they don't particularly like ads in their content viewing experience and so we looked at that trend realized that um while that may be true ad dollars are still growing exponentially around the world and continue to do so and so we looked at where can we you know shift the these, these ad dollars in front of and so um, what we've done is we've built out an entire you know entire vertically integrated advertising platform um, that delivers video impressions to retail locations and uh, to our, our main niches is, is slot machines and casinos so we looked at that there were a million slot machines in the United States and the average person sits on a slot machine for two to three hours with an uninterrupted experience. So if you deliver content and skip it, um, I can't turn it off. It, it's running, it's running during the entire experience. And so we went out and said, well, why can't we merge the multi-billion dollar programmatic video market with the multi-billion dollar casino gaming market and really spent the last couple of years, uh, building that highway. 
um, and then uh, leaned on also retail partners. So we have a retail footprint as well, because you know while we're very bullish on the the casino gaming market space, there's plenty of advertisers that say, "Look, I'm you know, be in one of those environments, but I'm a CPG brand that would love to be in a retail uh, retail place where you know people have spent the last couple of years." Um, trying to influence purchases online. And we're saying, let's try to influence purchases when you're actually out in brick and mortar, trying to drive more incremental sales right at the point of purchase. Very cool. So is it like a TV? Is it like an actual physical thing then that's like playing the ad that gets kind of in, installed in the slot machine or somewhere in the retail shop? Yeah. So the two, the, we have two distribution models. So the one, on to ATM distributors um, and these other groups that have slot machines in retail locations in the southeast. And they put a 20-inch monitor on top of that screen where somebody's sitting or doing a transaction. And then um, they they have a, um, a media player that runs our software, which then runs their internal content um, as well as our programmatic advertising that we sell through that marketplace. And then in the casino market, it's all software based. So um, you have, you know, on these million slot machines, there is a secondary screen about the size of an iPhone, and uh, it's called uh, it's called an iView. And so basically, we drive video ads to that screen that's already there. So our entire business model is looking at people that already have existing real estate, right? You're already leasing space on a casino floor, or you're leasing space in a retail location. And then us driving incremental dollars to that placement. So we're saying, look, we're not going to, we're not trying to change your business model. We're just trying to get you more dollars for something you're already paying for anyway. So cool. I love that. All right. Yeah. That's kind of what I was thinking when I was looking on your website. Cause when I started to read about the casinos, I was like, this must be the ads that you see if you're like playing a slot. And that's awesome, man. That sounds like a huge business. Thank you. Thank Brent, you. It's been, um, yeah. with that. Like what, that's such a sophisticated model. Like it, what went into you even brainstorming and was there just like a, a time of a clarity po moment in time there or was it kind of a buildup? I wish, man, I wish there was a moment in clarity. It was a bunch of bumping our heads forward as is, uh, you know, my partners like to say, failing forward, right? I mean, yeah. I, I've done a million things wrong, a million, but we were lucky enough that um, you know, because we've been a small team and we were able to fund it for our, uh, by ourselves, um, you know, that we've, we've gone through hundreds of iterations, you know, multiple development teams, learned a lot along the way. And I'd say we've, we've crystallized and pivoted, uh, our business model quite a bit. I mean, you know, for example, in the beginning, we were manufacturing our own hardware, wireless communications, uh, and then we were paying a flat monthly fee to basically lease the space out. And we realized that um, when you give hardware out for free, people don't take care of it because it didn't cost them anything. We realized that wireless data um, isn't actually, uh, unlimited wireless data really isn't unlimited. So we ran to that issue. And uh, so, you know, that's where the models evolved over time. But, um, you know, going into markets such as space and then also the ATM market where people have been looking for this solution um, for years and no one's been able to deliver it. We've been lucky enough to have really good partners that have seen the um, the progress we made over time and really were able to stick with us as we built out a viable business model, continue to tweak our software so that it was deployable you know, anywhere in the world. Wow. That's so does your... So I have a question. Does your business depend more on the companies like the casinos buying or renting the software or are you making your money off the advertiser uh, off the advertisers that are running the ads or are you guys splitting it so we're a, we're a um an advertising distribution partner right so we're not out there selling you know selling it as a SaaS product um you know we're, we're a rev share platform uh, so we figure we believe that aligns um incentives um with us and our partners Right, so the more money that we make them, the, the more money they make, the more screens they put out, the more money we both make. Um, so everything that we do is is rev share based. And are you a little concerned, uh, like that, possibly just due to what's happening with 
everything in the world right now and the casinos being in complete shutdown mode and obviously they they are going to reopen and things are eventually going to come back to normal but you know it, are you concerned that the loss capital that they're going to experience during those times are going to force them to cut back on a lot of things and, and leave you guys in a tough spot so it's it, you know it's a, it's a fair question so one um that's why we chose to be in two distinct verticals um because stuff always happens right and so um, being in retail allows us to hedge against that. But on the flip side, people are going to be looking for more incremental dollars. And we're a product that doesn't cost anything. So if you look at the casino market in general, most products are, this is, you're going to spend X and this is going to be your ROI on that, right? So you're going to give me $250,000 up front and then over a five-year period, I'm going to make you a million dollars, right? You have to do that calculation. For us, we're a software download. We don't cost anything. So you already have an existing piece of real and so, if anything, we think that help a million dollars in budget that may not be there. Casinos and uh, the ATM distributors is every machine has a you know an average revenue per day, and if we can add to that, we're just we're just adding money straight to their bottom line. I, I love the model because that, that's the thing. We, that's how we built our business at first, Brandon, where you go in and the vendor has nothing to lose. So if, if there's no right. cost or, yeah, if it's like worst case scenario, we bring you nothing, you owe us nothing. And that's yeah. a great, that's awesome. Yeah, it's great it's a, that you're able to get the software like for free because that way they're not like, oh, man, we can't afford the software. And then when the advertising dollars start pouring back in, you already have the software. So that's awesome, man. Genius model, man. Congratulations. Well, I'm, I'm with you. I mean, it's, it's in, in the sales process, right? It's, it's, it's reducing as many barriers as you can, right? So you don't get a no. So how, yeah. how can you make it something that, that – uh, that's hard to say no to. And like you say, I'm going to come in. It's not going to cost you anything, but I'm going to drive incremental value to you in a multitude of ways. Plus, I'm going to make you some more money. Um, you know, it makes it a lot easier to get people to say yes. That's cool because you that what you have there, Brandon. You can do with so many different things. Obviously, casinos are great, but like when you look at where self driving is going to be heading soon, and being able to partner with some of these huge brands for being in front of their consumers. That's a, that's incredible, man. So look, I have another question for you. So when you guys, like, you know, how right now, if we were running video ads and let's say like the way we do it right now is we look at the two major networks, Google and Facebook, and then they have their, you know, all their network sites that if you're running ads on Google, you're going to get on the different network sites. You know what I mean? I do. Yeah. Are you guys like your own separate thing then? So if we were, let's say, a company and we were interested in getting exposure in the casino world or the retail world, it's th that's completely separate from like Google or Facebook? Or are you guys like a part of one of those networks? Yeah. So um, you can buy us through the same the same exchanges, right? So we're integrated with all the exchanges that are buying across Google and Facebook. Um, but we actually, so you go back to, I think that's a, that's a, a good point is I was talking about earlier about the shifting in habits, you know, there's these walled garden, right? Google, Facebook. And, um, we looked at, there's a, there's a desire to get in front of different audiences and, um, compete outside of that duopoly. So, um, we think that that's what makes us really interesting. Is it somewhere else to get in front of eyeballs? You know, we fall under this cross-screen video or digital out of home um, vertical. And digital out of home is just starting to really get big and programmatic. I mean, I think two weeks ago, Uber announced their To, you know, yeah. online spaces own, right? So people are looking at where, where can I eyeballs dollars because it's not in a wall garden, and that's really where we've seen, um, you know, the shift in programmatic digital to home. 
Yeah, that's fascinating, man. I mean, it's cool because, you know, Dan and I, we've been so biased in our business off the Facebook and Google networks and trying to combat those that it's fascinating that you've thought in a different light completely with that approach where it's like, oh, there's competition outside of this for viewers. That That's really fascinating to think about. Thank you. It's, 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 uh, it's interesting. You see the rise of so-called independent ad tech. So um, there's quite a few public companies out there considered independent of Google. And they've actually, before the market uh, corrected here, you know, they had their, if you took an ETF, ETF bucket of those five or six stocks, they outperformed the S&P last year. Um, so independent ad tech has seen. Wow. Yeah, and I, I think there's a point, too, where we're at where people are kind of losing faith in the whole monopoly mentality where it's like these companies have so much power i, I think that gives you a, an avenue to run like crazy with this because i think there's been fatigue with these things in a way where you know all the talk around these top heavy companies but the reality is there have to be other voices out there and uh right. it sounds, you could be a, a huge one with what you're doing here it's like it's new age advertising that's awesome that's how we see it and Brandon, what would you say, like, how do you balance your day to day? Because I know you, real estate's a big part of your life as well uh, with Wilton Partner. So what exactly do you do to prioritize the two businesses? Because they're both beasts in their own right. Uh, um, you know, it's, it's you just got to stay focused. Um, you know, my business perpetual is, um, you know, my, my main focus. Um, you know, I'd say that I've been in, involved in real estate so, since I was probably 14 years old. Um, you know, my dad was a real estate developer for over 30 years. So I started going to meetings with him when I was 14. Um, you know, got to build some projects with him and see how, how that all worked. Um, you know, and then uh, I really started building my own company a couple of years ago in the technology space, and he was really hands off of that. Um, so, you know, but then uh, after, you know, he passed away last year, then all the real estate um, projects. So, you know, the way I try to prioritize my day is, you know, I get up at five in the morning, go to the gym, and then try to make all the calls I have on the East Coast first, um, you know, before it hits nine o'clock over here. So I can try to get all those things out before, you know, we have, uh, we're, we're a moat team at Perpetual. So we talk twice a day. So we, you know, we jump on an eight o'clock call in the morning and drop one, on one um, at the end of the day. So, I try to get everything that's not perpetual related done um, kind of before they were perpetual. Wow. That takes what, a lot of this. What are you doing for those morning workouts with the gyms being closed right now? It's tough. It's tough, man. That's probably the hardest part for me. Right? Um, you know, still trying to figure it out, trying to get in a rhythm and a cadence, but it's amazing how something you're so used to doing. Um, not being able to do it really throws off your day, which I know sounds ridiculous in the no, yeah, going on because it is ridiculous. Uh, I, but it's uh, you know when you're when you're used to your routine, it makes it a little difficult. I mean, Brandon, that's the thing though with entrepreneurship, as you're attesting to right now. Those foundations and pillars are so important. Daily habits and getting a great workout, and you know, it it provides a lot of stress release. And I, I think that's a big part of running your own business is having those pillars that you can rely on in times of uncertainty like this. So it's kind of crazy right. thinking even a work could get off track now. Yeah, I'm sure you guys have stuff every day that you do that's not business related. Just try to try to you know release the valve a little bit. Oh yeah, it's actually it's a lot of lately. <laughs> it's actually it's been interesting actually seeing like the new routines that I mean I've been seeing myself just try and get you know I'm forming my own routine with all of this that's different, but something that I could still kind of depend on each day that's there for me. And I've been running a lot more because I'm the same as you. And so is Mike. We wake up, we go to the gym and it's just instilled in us. And that's how we like to start our day. And I feel like a lot of entrepreneurs are like that. And now there's this like path across the street from where I live that I've been running on. And I like have that to look forward to as kind of my, my escape each <laughs> day. <laughs> I get it, man. It's it's the small things, right? But it it, it really is. It's, it's what keeps you sane. And 
and you know is is what really keeps you on pace because i feel like especially you know as you're on the grind the days kind of just melt into each other and so to to have something that that at least um, resets you every single day is so important as you as you get stuck you know fighting fighting the battles every day yeah sure <clears throat> about that man it's uh in terms of, have you been doing any food delivery now that you've been bunkered down brandon uh doing getting stuff off amazon for sure um you know i've got uh plenty of rations but i've been trying to go out and pick up the local restaurants i like you know i actually saw something that was pretty funny it was talking about um how you know before you go pick up your buy coffee and you were just seen as as lazy and you weren't you know you weren't a thrifty and you weren't saving and now it's turned into you know heroic um because to go out and support to support those businesses around you but um you know, I'd say for me, I'm still I'm still ordering out quite a bit, picking food up um, from the local spots that I like. And I figure, look, I've got plenty of food reserves. And if this gets really bad, then I've got, uh, you know, all that stuff sitting here for longer. But it's definitely weird to go into the markets and see mm. nothing there. And that's happened to me two or three times in the last week. So, yeah, it, shit is real. That, I never I feel like I'm <laughs> movie walking around i'm like there's no way this is actually happening and it is it's crazy man are yeah. you af are you afraid at all of just any part of this does any part of this like really scare you i think it's i think it's really strange i think what i'm afraid of is if it lasts for a really long time what's going to happen to our economy you know i think that um that okay, they quarantined us for a couple of months, which is horrible. But you look at, you know, for example, all the restaurants, they'll just go out of business. You know, they can't survive. And then restarting uh, small business owners across our country is going to be a huge problem. And so that part does scare me. It does scare me that um, I don't know how long this is going to take, but I think that, um, you know, there's a perfect, I'd say, example in the casino market. Um, you know, a lot of casinos are turning the screens off because nobody's in there, but they're leaving their systems on. Because to restart the systems um, costs a lot of money. And when you restart it, there could be issues, right? And so I mm -hmm. think that stopping our economy is one thing, but we don't even know the unintended consequences of trying to restart it and what that looks like. So that definitely um, is something I'm concerned with. That's crazy about the casinos. I never even thought about that. And they're probably running these outrageous electric bills, just keeping they're those insane. things on. Wow. Yeah, insane. I mean, the things are, are massive when you think about thousands of games running 24 seven that have to run on the best communication lines you can buy that are all encrypted. And, you know, it's amazing the IT that goes into those places. I remember reading once that I think it was Wynn that the Wynn Hotel in Vegas did like about a million dollars a day just in like their electricity costs I, I don't know if i'm I, I might be way off there it might have been something like they needed to have a hundred a million dollars in gaming happen a day to like maintain their costs or something it was just something that kind of highlighted how outrageously high the electricity costs were for these places i believe it yeah, yeah it's 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 one thing to have all these things on, but they all have to run a peak performance because they all have to deliver a certain amount of dollars every single day, 24-7. Yeah. Brandon, that's a great selling point for you, too, because it's like, hey, guys, you're making more because you're 24-7 operating. So that's awesome for you right there. Right. Look, you're going to be open anyway, and what's amazing is, you know, you look at the data from these consumers, and there's people in them 24-7, actually. There's, you know, these things are never empty. There's always people playing and the numbers are way higher than I think they would be. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that, and I know we talked about this last time uh, when I saw you in New York, where, you know, I think that, you know, two years ago, the cannabis user was somebody who was, you know, a marketing to a cannabis user was something that was, that was taboo. And now you drive around Los Angeles and every single board is a cannabis user. I think we're going to see the same thing in gaming with the legalization of sports betting you know, the convergence, like, like Penn National buying Bar Barstool Sports. I think we're going to see the convergence of the, um, you know, the, like, and the, you know, the casino gaming market really come together and be something that's far more mainstream. Do yeah. you, do you work with any of the Penn Nationals? 
We do not, not right now. Damn, I was going to ask you what the if they were like going bankrupt or what their deal was. I bought their stock after the Barstool acquisition, and <laughs> it has not been good. Well, you know, when you look at the casino market in general, I mean, if you think about you know, the markets are supposed to price in you know future earnings, right? And so if you look at the casino, you know, the casino stocks, it's kind of the perfect storm. None of the casinos are open, so they can't generate income out of revenue. Uh, because they're closed, they're not going to order more hardware, so they can't sell hardware. And then for these these companies that do sports betting as well, there's no sports. So if you think about the absolute worst scenario for these companies it's right now which is why their prices i mean pen i think pen went all the way down to four bucks right and now it's back up to nine yeah um, yeah for 850 as of today you know same thing with with a lot of these other uh, other uh gaming stocks but i'm a big believer that you know people's consumer habits are not going to change you know this world the world's going to go back to the way it was at some point in time and people are still going to gamble and they're still going to get on yeah people are and so i really think that you look at a lot of those those gaming stocks; they're going to come back. It's just right now, you know, just like travel. I mean, look at look at Royal Caribbean and any of the airlines. I mean, they're getting decimated right now, but you know, the majority of those guys, I know they're you know supposed to get large bailouts here soon, but the majority of them will still exist, and they'll you know they'll be back to where they were, um, you know, in a year or two from now. So the question is, does the restructure of the bailouts with those companies cause them to never quite get back? Almost like what happened with you know, AIG and some of those companies in 08. That's kind of my fear with a company like Penn, not so much the bigger gaming companies like MGM, Wynn, things like that. And I don't know anything about Penn. I just worry, like, does that company have, like, insane balance where they're about to get restructured because they can't get through this and the bailout, like, really kind of changes things? And as a shareholder, I'm just washed out. That's just what I hope doesn't happen. Yeah, I think, look, I think Penn's going to be okay. I think that buying Barstool was a really smart thing to do. Like, you talk about customer acquisition, right? And you say, how do I get a new customer? I'm buying Google and Facebook. Okay, they just bought one of the most loyal fan bases in the world and uh, and one that also gambles. I, I'm probably misquoting you, but I thought I saw some stat after the acquisition that 66% of stoolies were sports bettors or something like that. I mean, it was some insane number. And so when you look at that and you look at the brand affinity for Barstool, when people start saying when these casinos do open back up and people are going to Barstool branded casinos, I mean, just like when they when Barstool bought, um, you know, Rough and Route out of, uh, you know, out of West Virginia and turned that into a pay-per-view that people order, you know, it's it wasn't like five people ordered it. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, I've seen a couple <laughs> of them, right? I've ordered a couple. Of them. I love it. And when you talk about. Yeah. And so you talk about. The fact that they were able to buy a back, you know, a backyard boxing company out of what West Virginia, and turn it into a pay-per-view event that thousands of people buy. I mean, their brand is it's unbelievable. So wow. I think I think it was really smart for Penn to do. I just think that you know this is more a a reflection of what's happening to gaming as a whole right now. But um, you know that's all temporary. Wow, we got to get you on CNBC, man. I'm about to double down on Penn after your talk right there. You just, you just like made me realize why I like them to begin with. You're right, though. Barstool's genius, and just having them like attached that 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 was a power move. You bring up a lot of good points there. Well, you look at you know once it was down at four bucks, what was the market cap at four bucks? A couple hundred million, something like that. Yeah, it was yeah like what they bought Barstool for basically. Exactly. And so you yeah. look at, I mean. It's it's people who bet against Barstool and Portnoy seem to lose over and over and over again. I mean, every single time churn and bought in, people thought they were ridiculous. You know, they made a uh, um, a massive return on what they invested, and and the brand's just getting bigger and bigger. And you look at, you know, like the and I was the kid who grew up and watched Sports Center five hours in a row, and I just watched it with a different anchor. You know, and yeah, I, I watched it exactly I, every every day. Every day. And I look back on it and I go, I barely watch sports on it. I think it sucks. I think the, you know, they took the attitude that the, and the, the, you know, the anchors didn't matter. They let them all go. Um, you know, and then Dan Patrick went and did his own thing. I mean, Bill Simmons just sold the ringer to Spotify, right? For four Um And uh, uh, I really think that the, the younger audience is looking for, um, you know, something that's not just sports, but also something that's real. Because everything, 
and the news, you know, regardless of what channel you watch is, is so slanted that I think that um, everyone thinks it's refreshing to get some, so to get some take that's unfiltered. I just think that that's going to continue to grow in the, you know, in our country for sure. Yeah. And they're so good with what they do. They're so genius. They are. It, it's genius. I mean, they get away with stuff that every other media brand would probably go bankrupt over or have to fire everybody. And they get away with it. Page views go up, and and uh, you know they thrive on on uh, you know controversy. They absolutely thrive on it. For yeah, sure. Or a conviction with uh, your business, like when you really believe in something, there's a power behind that that just pushes through. And even when some of these things are so outrageous from the outside, there's a reason they pop up. You know. And I think we could all attest to that in our own ways, in our own businesses, where certain things that seem kind of magical that have happened, but we've, we've wanted it and worked for it so badly that that's what happened. You know, Portnoy started that business handing out flyers on the street. He just was ruthless. That's right, like that. from his basement. Yeah. I mean, just yeah. like you and I talked about, dude, some, some of the things that, that you guys have accomplished in your business, you know, plenty of people have told you absolutely not, right? But you just, you just keep keep grinding and, and have that conviction. I think that conviction and determination and ability to um, absorb pain is like 95% of figuring out how to be a successful entrepreneur, right? Because a lot of it's painful. It just is. Oh, yeah. and, but when you I accept mean, that it's horrible. painful and you, and you, uh, and you, um, you know, thrive in those things, it makes you a better version of yourself. For sure. I think that's what makes all of us too, like how we're all hardwired. We embrace that pain and almost enjoy it in a way where you just, I remember watching that in Ray Lewis's retirement speech where he just talked about embracing the pain where he turned it into pleasure. And I, I think, that's right. You, right. You, it's like eating healthy yeah. food. First it sucks. And after a while your taste buds adapt and it's like, Oh, I love multi-grain bread. What, what are you talking about? So, you know, yeah, it's a great. That's a great analogy. You're right because it's good for you, and it's it's unfortunately all the stuff that's not good for you, they make it very easy to do. Oh, that is why people get such bad habits. It's so much easier to do stuff that's not good for you. It really so is. it's so much more accessible. It's so much faster. You know the the barriers to entry are so much lower. It's also and so it's, it's yeah. You know that's my problem with it. A lot of the stuff that's bad for you is a lot of fun. So it's, you know, I, I've, I've got that all or nothing mentality, Brandon. So I have to always try to focus on the positive <laughs> as much as possible. That's right. <laughs> yeah, man. Well, dude, what would you say back to food for a second here? If it was your last meal on earth, like all calories to the side, they don't matter at all. What, what would it be? What would it be? Oh, I would, it would be sushi a hundred percent and I would eat till I couldn't move. I love um, oh, well, I knew I liked this guy. What's what? your favorite role? Oh man, that's tough. Um, so I got a lot of sushi places I like, but probably my favorite role is an aburi seared salmon roll from this place called California Roll Factory mm. um, in San in Santa Monica. Um, it's probably my favorite. I could probably eat like six of those. I'd probably die after, but I could definitely eat probably six of them. Um, <laughs> but mm. that's how I would go out. Younger me, the kid version of me would have told you McDonald's, but um, now definitely, uh, definitely sushi. What about you guys? I dig it. That, that's a good question. I would sushi would definitely be part of that. I'm a real hand roll guy. I love salmon. Uh, I'm a big LA man, like sugar fish. I've been to in Santa Monica a bunch. I love that place. I think they have one out here too. We'll have to dive into sushi next time we're in the same neck of the woods. I think yeah, there's definitely. someone put a gun to my head right now and was like one one chance last meal i'd probably go with kfc wow yeah go and paint down like a bucket yeah. of chicken fourth of, you know brand our family used to just do fourth of july <laughs> that was one treat every year we're getting kfc for fourth of july <laughs> that, you know that that's embedded in dan's food nostalgic memory yeah. there it really is. It's with so the good. Uh, with the with the mashed potatoes and the gravy too. Yeah, oh. like twelve biscuits. There you biscuits. Go. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. 
have better biscuits than Red Lobster. Both of those, like I remember just housing those as a kid. Mm-hmm. Just go to Red Lobster and the, those cheddar biscuits. Oh man, they were something. But yeah, I think I would have to have some a sweet tooth in there of some kind, cured. Like a chocolate mousse cake, something where I'm eating an entire cake, like that Matilda movie, the chocolate cake, in there. <laughs> yeah, I guess yeah. for like 20 minutes. So you know, that could be a lot of fun. But it's always cool to think about that because we are in an apocalypse, possibly right now. So, <laughs> <laughs> Brandon, man, I really appreciate the time. It's been a lot of fun having you on. Yeah, and, uh, thanks, guys. I appreciate it. Thank you, yeah, man. Everyone, Perpetual Media Network, be on the lookout. Brandon's crushing it, and uh, pumped to see your ads out there soon, man. That sounds good, man. Look forward to seeing you soon in New York. You too. Stay safe, man. Take it easy, guys. Appreciate the time. Thank you. Well, that uh, that was awesome. Yeah. Held it. Brandon, uh, for our listeners, he's a real workhorse out in L.A., great guy. You know, Dan, I'm not one of those people. I, I try to give everyone the, the benefit of a doubt, but you know me, I, I don't like, like genuinely like most people. And this guy, I met him, and I'm like, oh, this guy's the man. Great person. He's got, Humble he's got a really, yeah, super yeah. interesting business, too. Very interesting business. It kind of re- reminded me of us, in a way, with uh, – you know, back in the day with the advertising mentality, with the risk-free, you know, you have nothing to lose working with us. I, I think a lot yeah. can be said for that trust, building rapport going in with a client where they have no reason not to try. Totally. So thanks again, Brandon. Uh, looking forward to seeing you again when you're in New York or when I'm out in California. Uh, but Dan, yeah, I guess... I wanted to talk to you a bit about this Malcolm Gladwell book because, quite frankly, I'm, I wanted to, first off, apologize for recommending this one. I think it was awful. <laughs> it was, I, you know, I'm a big Malcolm Gladwell fan. I'll be the first to say tipping point, outliers, blank, game-changing for me as a marketing mind, like trying to learn about it. I remember the tipping point before that. It was just I, I didn't really understand. I thought marketing was something completely different, and that almost turned it into an orchestra. You know, so I don't know, Dan, I don't know what you thought, but I thought it was a very bland book, like Gladwell's too paid and fat now, even though not fat physically, just he's in that mentality. Like I read this, I'm like, dude, first of all, I thought it was going to be about stranger danger way more where like the whole like talk, it's like, oh, you guys should do more of that. Instead, it went over how you misinterpret body language. Like I thought the way he broke down that whole girl that got uh, you know acquitted eventually that got accused of murder that that just didn't really resonate with me the way he went into this book in the first place i i was really annoyed i'm with you it was tough to actually get into it you know yeah and i, I, was... I, I and and you're the same and I, I thought the same thing like right when i opened it i thought it was gonna be all about like i thought it was gonna take away from that like a new way to approach talking to strangers literally and it seems like it was more a book that was like written about the whole black lives matter movement the only thing i kept thinking to myself and i don't want this to come out wrong was just like man how nice would it be to be back in those times where uh, this is this just sounds fucked up what i'm trying to say is Anything seems like simple times compared to what we're in right now. That's what I was thinking when I was reading that. I was like, man, this is like just, all right, we're reading about this. And this was a time when people were at least able to leave their damn homes. It kind of reminded me of that Manisca- Sebastian Maniscalco skit where he goes over like the difference between now and back in the day when someone rang your doorbell. Where it <laughs> your pajama pants back in the 90s like who's there mom (laughs) and now you know you're getting the gun ready and it's just funny to think about that because i see like obviously guns and ammunition sales went through the roof through this whole thing you've got a bunch of people just in that mode of oh well you never know and uh it's just crazy to me how i know we wanted to touch on this corona bit i mean to give you my two cents quickly dan I think like what even what we were just talking about with Brandon about the few that's my only concern is the economy itself. My guess is Trump is going to make a big announcement in the next 10 days that this 
lockdown is ending. I'm I'm calling it now that he made a tweet yesterday that kind of hinted at he you know any anyone can say anything they want about Trump, and the reality is this: he's going to do what he's going to do, and he is ticked off right now that the governor of New York Cuomo is taking the spotlight in the media around this virus. And he's about to, in his own way, take it back. Uh, I personally think I get short term what the, the, you know, angle was with trying to keep everyone locked down to make room for more people with beds. I'm thinking, and I hope I'm right on this, but looking at the data, I have it pulled up right now. These coronavirus deaths, Dan, if you really look across the board, this is being contained pretty well. Like the U.S., for example, we've had 42,000. Wait, why can't I hear you? What's going on? Hi, right, now I can hear you. I was saying uh, USA, there's been 42,379 cases of corona, 517 deaths. So... When you break down, obviously Italy has a terrible health care system, hence why they're, they have 6,077 deaths, which is almost 10% of their cases. But when you're breaking down our country here, we're talking about a, let me do the math on this. I want to make sure I'm doing this right. But, and don't get me wrong, it's not that low, but it's, it's about 1% then. I think These it's just... I almost think I think it's too early to, to make that call. It seems like but so we're gonna see in a couple weeks. I think this thing is too late to quote unquote contain and our best yeah. strategy is letting people out and about to consume and do. You know? I I, I agree, man. I, I don't think I think they did this without actually having a plan and I get it because it was an emergency situation and they were late to figure it out, but they didn't figure it out. And this whole lockdown thing is almost to make people feel good about something that wasn't contained. And now exactly. you're just destroying lives in a whole different way. And not to mention, like, there's the there's the economy. That, that, that's one part of it, which they don't understand. And there's not one person that's behind closed doors making decisions that has any fucking clue as far as like what's really going on with the everyday American, they're trying to take politicians are all rich and fat. They're not like, even when you look at the bipartisan non agreements, it doesn't matter if they're a Democrat or Republican, they are not worried personally about any of this. And that's at the all. biggest problem. And even yeah. when you really look at like what they're possibly thinking, whether it's one trillion, two trillion, three trillion, four trillion, our unemployment rate's gonna go up to like twenty five percent. There's no way around it because it's already happening. They're trying to come out with the stimulus plan two weeks too late. Like it already happened. The layoffs happened, and the layoffs that haven't happened are gonna happen in the next twenty four to forty eight hours. It, it they could announce something in two minutes, and it doesn't change what already happened. The damage is already done, and I, that's also when. The train of thought, Dan, on where, where we're heading as a society. I know me and you have talked in, at length randomly about universal basic income, and they've tried it out in Scandinavia a bit. I don't think when you look at the future of the world progress being able to happen, I think we need to figure out, and I'm a, you know I'm a conservative by most measures, but when it comes to this stuff, hum, human needs have to be met in order for people to be productive members of society. When you look at someone that is constantly stressed out about putting food on the table, paying rent, being healthy, what are they really able to do to help contribute? All they're doing is thinking about their own problems that they shouldn't have in the first place. That's what has to be addressed from all this because you're spot on. The, the unemployment rate, it, it's going to go way up. And quite frankly, a lot of these people should not have been in the jobs that they were employed to do because it should have been automated. A lot of these technologies have been shelved for years because of this exact problem. And now we're seeing what happens when all of those jobs get yanked. It's not just a restart. Brandon made a great point earlier with what casinos do that me and you didn't even realize about keeping their systems operating because it's too expensive to shut them down. That's where we're at now as a society. We're all shut down. 
So starting it, we have to ask ourselves, are we better off figuring out a, a new strategy for building up society instead of going back to these, oh, well, we're, we're going to have a... We're going to have stimulus plans and keep printing money. I don't see where that's heading long term except potential riots and looting and imbalance. We need to figure out how to actually have people educating themselves or being re-educated on what's coming and not needing to make money to just make ends meet. But their money yeah, well, is being, you know, going into the next wave of technology and learning how to do things that are coming. It's complicated because on one end, you're saying that we basically need universal income. But on the other, you're saying that we need to stop printing money. And like you can't really have both. And the problem with printing money, and this is the problem that I'm sure people way smarter than me are talking about behind closed doors right now, is do you print money and try and save everybody and then deal with the consequences of potential inflation which doomsday economists are saying is around the corner anyway where all of a sudden you got ten thousand dollars in the bank and it's worth two thousand because the dollars worth 20 cents and we've had this like extremely strong dollar but you know that's where behind closed doors you could only bail out i know they hate the word but that's what it is you could only bail out the united states economy so much before it's like okay you're gonna throw 10 trillion at this thing and you're gonna still say that the dollar is the strongest currency in the world like at that point at what point does the dollar collapse is my question well and, that's, and that's, why that's the interesting point of the world currency and where that's heading because there's no doubt something has to get here and i think what you were talking about with everyone having their base needs net and printing can happen simultaneously. Well, maybe it could at the short term. Like, I don't think this whole solution is let's bandaid this thing and give people a couple of checks. That's not going to solve anything at the end of the day. They need to be given ongoing checks and we have to figure out what we can be doing with these people to shift them into a different type of data. And I think we're going to see a lot of things expedited with things being automated that should not be run. That's just that's where we've been as a society for years. So that that's what we have to figure out. If we want to progress in the world and keep building, we have to address this and deal with it, or we're not going to move anywhere but down. And yeah, I mean, definitely. No, I mean, look, the thing that scares me ultimately is what you're talking about. Could it? probably is like it's going to happen at some point but the problem is right now what they're talking about is so far from that where that might happen maybe four or five six months down the road maybe a year maybe two years who knows they're talking about this two million dollar stimulus plan or two trillion i'm sorry two trillion and when you really think about it that does nothing to fix what's happening right now which is complete shutdown mode that's gonna leave so many people just screwed you're either in the category of having a very very successful business that has a really good balance sheet and you're gonna be taken care of or you're in the category of businesses that were you know kind of in not that bad of a spot and we're not that good of a spot and we're grinding those companies are fucked and you know that we're we're in trouble right now i mean we're hardly meet and pay. We're literally at the point, unless things went back to normal tomorrow, which they're not, where like we basically have to choose which vendors to pay and which ones where we're just like, yeah, we can't pay this right now. And and that I can't and, and we're one of the only businesses that's still operational, but we're not up. I mean we rely on colleges and businesses that aren't even in session right now. So when you think about us, we're down but we're still in business. There's places that aren't even allowed to open their doors and they're still having to deal with the rent and things like that. And, you know, it, they already needed to get those checks to, to pay the rent, to, to keep Everything. the employees that already got fired. It's leading away from a democracy is what all this is, is the scary thing. That's what scares me about all these things is small businesses being wiped off the map. And all of a sudden you're having the big brother mentality where you have three retailers, Walmart. Amazon, Costco, like the thought of those things are just beyond scary. We already have that problem in media when you think about it. So what's next here?
And, and that's yeah. where you have to ask yourself, where is all that heading? And unfortunately, I, I don't really see it heading anywhere but into top heaviness and there being massive changes with the structure of things. <laughs> I, I think yeah, it's going to I mean, be... A- no, you're dead on. People keep talking about how certain trends are going to expedite and certain trends are going to backtrack. One of the trends that's definitely going to expedite is there's definitely more and more money. And we talked about this on one of our first podcasts. There's more and more money going into small, fewer companies, fewer larger companies. It, there used to be more money just diverse more where there was more companies getting money now there's more money but there's fewer companies getting the money and that's definitely a trend that will continue because of this because the small guys yeah they're not going to make it and they're not they didn't get the bailout in time and now we're in this like wait and see game where you know it's just a matter of time and that's where we're able to we, we own a business we see exactly the effects that are happening and how a lot of the effects that are happening haven't actually happened yet and that's where like when you look at the economy the impact hasn't happened but the damage has happened and it's almost you know what i mean it's almost like the storm's yeah. happening you haven't been able to see yeah. the impact yeah well i mean we're starting to see the unemployment rate day by day now go up with people yeah, so if you're a company now and you hear that there's some stimulus plan where you can go and apply for more money, you're going to figure that out. You're going to take the days it takes to do that because they're going to get inundated with requests. And your first thought isn't going to be, let me rehire these people at all. Those people are out of jobs. Until- well, and that's, what I think that's the problem, though. We need There's a bunch of people that are going to be out of jobs that need to be educated on new new careers that are that's the ongoing issue for the vicious cycle so that's where i I think we've got to figure out as a culture how to shift curves on the focus here instead of a band-aid building an actual dam and bridge you know with how to approach people's day-to-day lives and you know i i think clearly it's not an overnight answer and i don't know how this is going to happen but there's no doubt we're heading for a different world with the universal basic income is something like when you think of even Star Trek, obviously it's sci-fi, but it's based in the 2300s. It's money means nothing. Like it doesn't matter. People don't make money. It's not like a thing. So I, I think when you think of like a utopia for a, like a, an actual balanced world and a healthy society, not not a, an American or a German or French a world society that has to be figured out a world currency and universal based income or else yeah, we're going to the things, you know, humanity well, is not going to be much longer otherwise. What you're talking about is a world that we would not enjoy. We've lived in a world no, where we, we don't know what that entails, Dan. I just think there, it's more about figuring out how these people need to have their needs met ongoing. Like there needs to be a way to figure that out. And I think entrepreneurship is a big part of that. So uh, that's the thing. When you think of entrepreneurs, that's what makes America unique is the opportunity to start something. And I, I think that in times like this is when things like that happen. And it takes minds like guy, guys like ours even to create opportunities in times like For this. For sure. And no, it, definitely. It's in a different way. Yeah. So, you know. I mean, I know uh, we're in a unique spot here, but I, I think there's potential synergies that could prosper and come to fruition for us from this with certain companies that could use our help and vice versa, where, you know, teamwork makes the dream work. Someone needs a cog in their wheel that we might have to make that wheel go around again. Yeah. Dude, I feel like, and this is probably super naive of me and not how things work at all but it's like the coronavirus kind of like already made its way through new york and you didn't catch it and now like i'm worried now it's like it's it's making its way now to the rest of the country and and i know this isn't like necessarily how it works but i'm just uh, i'm thinking now like the next few days i I don't fucking want to get this goddamn virus dude first of all don't jinx in it over here 
Uh, that's try. I'm not trying to jinx you. I'm just. Um, I've been over the last 24 hours not feeling 100. percent Donald said it best. He's like, dog. This thing. Most people are going to end up getting it. Most people won't even really have any symptoms. They'll be very mild, if anything. And that's, you know, I completely agree with him. I, I think this is just something that you're going to see certain people that are not feeling great from this, unfortunately. And for sure, it sucks. I'm looking at the data here. This is where I just don't trust China at all with their data. They've had 81,000 cases, 3,270 deaths. They've said there's been 72,703 people that have recovered. So I just, when, when you look at the ratio of all these other countries and their recoveries, it doesn't add up then. Yeah, I don't believe anything coming out of that country. I, uh, I've been way more personally out of China, just out of the way. I, I can't imagine their death ratio is where it is. Like, I, I, you know, one of those things where you really break it down, it's actually 4%. Wow. Never mind. That's pretty high for China. Yeah, but uh, well, I, 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 not, no. it could be I higher. Believe- yeah, I mean, what I don't believe is just the fact that everything's fine now. I I don't know. And I hate how they don't, like... I, I almost... Dan, the whole everything's fine. It's not that everything's fine. It's the, that there's not going to be anything that can be done by keeping people locked down. It's past the point. It's just there's going to be certain people more immune to this than others, and it's going to run its course. Us yeah, their lockdown mode is just doing more harm than good. And we'll see that in the next couple of weeks, and this will be alleviated. Is there anything that you're like, you know, new habits you've been developing or just things that you're kind of doing different? I mean, this I know how much this probably sucks for you. You love being around people. Yeah, I mean, I've been just, you know, washing my hands a bit more frequently. I honestly have not. I've tried. I think a lot of this stuff is keeping a positive mindset and not getting too down that rabbit hole of, oh, shit. So I've been trying to keep myself preoccupied. We had a lot going on with the business, you know, doing my usual workouts, meditating, reading, journaling, you know, me with the pillars. Like I, I have a steady flow of things I do regardless of my external situations. So, Dude, I, I actually think- have a great show recommendation for you. Hold on a second. I've been watching it. It's fucking dope. I think you'll really like it. I'm pulling it up right now. But yeah, uh, now, have you- no doubt it. I- has been brutal. I'm, I'm pumped to, I did not come out here for isolation and that's what, you know, it's just part of the game right now. Of course. Dude, check out uh, Project Blue Book on Prime. I will. It's, uh, it's young like, man? young man's good. He's, uh, he's actually developing some bad habits re- re- revolving around just being too defensive when he's, when his food's out. It's actually really pissing me off. We're going to have to have a chat about it. But, uh, yeah, oh, man. Project awesome. Blue Book, man, it's sick. It's, like, about alien stuff. But it's, like, fiction, but it's based off of, like, things that have happened, like the Lubbock Lights. It's it's really cool. It's a great show. Project Blue Book? Yeah, Project Blue Book. I'll check it out. And, yeah, have you seen Bombshell? I have. I actually watched that last night. Have you seen the Hillary Clinton documentary? Oh. Uh, where uh, where is the um, document? Still expecting that woman to start popping up out of the woodworks there soon. Wait, I missed what you said. Did you watch it or no? Uh, where, what's it on? It's on Hulu. I thought it was on Netflix. I watched it. It's a, it's actually really good. It's like five different uh, episodes. Oh, Hillary. It's on Hulu. Hey, what's it called, Hillary? Uh, I don't know. But if you type in Hillary. You can't miss it. Out. I, I personally think she's uh, waiting for her spot here. I, I'm still not sold on Joe Biden being the Democratic nominee. I, I just don't buy it. I really don't. I mean, yeah, it's... He's I don't know. Getting, wait for it. Something's brewing here, Dan. I'm telling you. Someone else is going to be the candidate that's going to come up, pop up. Well, what's is, making you say that? Something's just brewing. I feel it. 
I don't know what makes me say that. I just don't see Joe Biden being the Democratic nominee. I don't. The guy is not suitable, mentally fit at all to be the president. I, people are like, oh, he had a stutter growing up. That's not what's going on here. It has nothing to do with a stutter. It's him, you know, a few years ago, he could have been there, but I, I just yeah. don't see a guy in office for four years at all. He's pretty old. <laughs> Big time. Do you see? What's yeah. seven? You know? All right. Well, uh, oh, you see that stand Florida spring breakers test positive for coronavirus. All these kids partying in groups. Look what happens. Fucking idiots, dude. Well, enjoy dinner, Dan. Time to my stomach's churning here. Time to break this intermittent fast. It's been a good one. Yeah, man, for sure. Stay healthy. So, see ya. Peace.